In this video, I want to explain uh, some of the most important parts of chemistry to you, actually, uh, and that's having to do with understanding electrons. Electrons are these teeny tiny little particles that you've been learning about or being reminded about uh, that are part of the atom structure that occupy the electron cloud. And by now, hopefully, you've started to, to learn more about the details of that and that electrons are found in energy levels and not just in the electron cloud, um, that they're in those specific distinct energy levels, which sort of approximate an average distance from the nucleus, and that the higher the energy level is, from one up to seven, the further out from the nucleus the electron uh, is, is found, or would, would be found in, in an average moment uh, in the life of an electron. And that we consider those second, third, fourth, and progressively further from the nucleus uh, energy levels to be higher energy levels that uh, require the electron that have higher energy to be in those levels and that electrons tend to be in their lower energy positions first. So they tend to be in the first energy level until that level is, is rather, rather occupied. And then level two is filled with electrons and level three and so forth from there. It's important that before we get too far into electrons to know that we really don't fully have a great way to explain them because they behave in such an unusual way. They behave both as particles and as light. And so it makes them really complicated to explain and fully understand. But we're gonna do our best because we need to have some sort of understanding of electrons if we're going to understand how bonding occurs and a lot of other properties about the elements. So to get into energy levels again, remember that an energy level re represents the average distance of an electron from the nucleus. So if you already have that down, that's fine, but you, it's important that you understand that when we say energy levels with regard to electrons, that that's what we mean. We're not talking about, oh, they're tired, or they're relaxed, or they're excited, or, or they're energetic. It's, it's to be described in an atom as their average distance from the nucleus. So an electron in, in energy level two is further from the nucleus on average than an electron in level one. And you get the idea for the higher energy levels then from there. That they all occupy a cloud, but that cloud is not just a random cloud, it's sort of an organized cloud. And it has a sort of uh, semi-understood structure to it. Some people will call those electron shells instead. Sometimes you'll hear electrons are in, in the first shell or the second shell. I don't like to use that word because it tends to imply sort of a rigid hardness to it, like a shell would have on a turtle or even like on an M&M or something. Whereas electrons aren't really in rigid, hard uh, positions so much as they're just at those distances. But if we think about shells as like layers, and that kind of works for us as well. And again, that there are seven energy levels that we kind of number as one through seven. And we describe them specifically as, as N equals one through seven. So if you see N equals one or N equals four, it's describing which energy level, one up to seven, that electron is found in. And the, the more electrons an atom or an element has in its atoms, uh, the more energy levels will be occupied. So an element like sodium with just 11 electrons will typically have electrons found then in the first three energy levels, while a more elaborate, larger atom perhaps might have elements in as many as six or even seven energy levels if it has quite a few more electrons. Up to the largest, most complicated atoms that we know, which have electrons in as many as those seven electron energy levels. And it might very well be that someday we'll be able to synthesize in the lab elements that have electrons even in the eighth energy level. That could happen uh, in your lifetime or my lifetime because there's people working on it all the time in their efforts to better understand how atoms are built. So when you hear about seven energy levels, the periodic table uh, is as uh, common as it is, as ubiquitous as it is in chemistry and in science. There's, there are seven uh, rows in its organizational structure, and you can see them here. I've numbered them one through seven. Those seven rows then sort of match with or correspond to the energy levels of um, the atoms. And so if you're an element in row six uh, in this structure, then that means you have electrons in up to six energy levels, but not in the seventh one. And if you're an element in row four, then that means that you have electrons in four energy levels, but not in the fifth, sixth, or seventh one, in your normal ground relaxed state. Okay? So when we look at those energy levels, it's important that we know that. And so on a blank periodic table, perhaps, um, we would label those as one through seven in our organiza organizational plan. Okay? Each energy level then, one through seven, has a specific sort of capacity for electrons at the maximum. So they can, they can include, an energy level can include as many as a specific maximum number of electrons that we can calculate as two n squared. So for energy level one, uh, two n squared would be two times one squared. So that's two, two electrons at the very most in energy level one. And we can take it from there. Energy level two can have as many as two times two squared. So two times four, which is eight electrons. Energy level three can have two times three squared, which is 18 electrons. 
energy level four, ex expanding on that has as many as 32 electrons. You kind of get the idea that we can estimate then the capacity of any energy level at its very maximum fullness of electrons. But it's also important to know that in most atoms, um, that the energy levels aren't full, that they're holding something less than their maximum capacity. Very, very few elements where all of the energy levels are completely maxed out. Usually there are some full energy levels perhaps, and then some that are that are less than filled because we find that the electrons fill in sort of a, a, a predictable way, but that only a few elements are at maximum capacity, if you want to think about it that way. So what about energy level one with two electrons? We said that energy level one can hold two times one squared electrons, so that's a total of two. That sounds pretty simple. Two electrons, that shouldn't be too complicated. So if we look a little bit more closely at energy level one with its maximum of two electrons, we also want to go a little further in understanding of this and be able to say more than just mathematically 2n squared at its capacity. We have a, a much deeper, more complete understanding of electrons than just total number that can fit in an energy level. We actually understand them a bit more. And what we find is that in energy level one, those electrons that are closest to the nucleus, those two electrons are found in what we would describe as a sphere-shaped region in the electron cloud. So if you think about the electron cloud as, as sort of like a, a galaxy of electrons around a central, or say a solar system perhaps of electrons around a central nucleus. Um, those first two electrons in energy level one, they sort of exist in a region that looks like a sphere. And so it's centered on the nucleus as all the electrons are, their paths, their motion, are sort of centered symmetrically on a nucleus in the middle with those protons and neutrons. And the attraction to those protons, especially because of their opposite charges, protons being positive and electrons being negative, those attractions between oppositely charged particles are sort of what's sort of part of understanding how the electrons remain centered on that nucleus. And so the two electrons in, in energy level one are found in a sphere-shaped region in the electron cloud. That's, that's what we know about them. They're found in a sphere-shaped region. In energy level two, we have two times two squared, so eight electrons total and what we understand about level two and those electrons being just a little further from the nucleus, remember each energy level is progressively further from the nucleus, is that those eight electrons are also organized in a way that we can predict and understand. Two of the electrons, the first two, are found again in a sphere. So it's a sphere just like in level one, but it's going to be a sphere that's a little further out from the nucleus basically. So the first layer and then around it a slightly larger but still sphere shaped second layer. But the other six electrons are not moving about or found in a sphere-shaped region. What we find with those other six electrons is that they tend to occupy sort of a figure eight shaped region in the electron cloud. Figure eight shaped, sometimes you'll hear me define it as sort of hourglass shaped, so it's shaped a bit like an hourglass, or shaped like a sort of an infinity symbol. But remember, all these electrons are moving in a three-dimensional way. So uh, the best way to think about it perhaps is like an hourglass. Okay, we have an hourglass which has that sort of two lobes that are symmetrical, top and bottom, but they're definitely three-dimensional, and they taper down to a little skinny point in the middle where the sand moves through from, from top to bottom. That would be sort of like the nucleus then in terms of a geometry and understanding the, the position of those electrons, those six electrons that are found in a figure eight shape. What about level three? Well, again, we just build on the ideas that we've had. We're out a little further from the nucleus now. The first two electrons are still found in a sphere. They're just a little further out than before, so the, the first two electrons in level one, very close to the nucleus, those six, two and six for a total of eight electrons in level two, they're, they're a little further out from the nucleus on average. And then these two electrons in level three, the first two again, are found in a sphere that's even further from the nucleus than before on average. Six of them are found in a figure eight shape, so this should sound familiar, six of them are in figure eights. Again, figure eights that have the same sort of hourglass shape, but are a little further out from the nucleus, a little bit larger in shape. And again, this is somewhat simplified to sort of fully understand the physics of this. You would take sort of a, a advanced level chemistry course at a college level, but for our explanation, this will be this will be sufficient. What about the other 10? We have 18 total, but this is two and six, that's only eight. So where are the other 10 electrons? We found those we find those 10 electrons in level three in, in what we would describe as sort of a clover leaf shaped region. So it's a four leaf clover shaped region, but it's three dimensional. I almost imagine that like a double hourglass where there's two hourglasses that are sort of perpendicular to each other. And we have this sort of four leaf clover lobe shaped region. Um, and again, three dimensional. So it's not flat like a four leaf, four leaf clover, but three dimensional, but sort of with that four, four leaf clover sort of look to it. 
So we have three sort of different shapes here, spheres, figure eights, and then clover leaves, all of them three-dimensional in, in their shape overall. And then finally for level four, we have two electrons even further out from the nucleus with these in level four that are in a sphere, six that are in a figure eight shaped region, and 10 that are in a clover leaf shaped region. So they're all just similar in shape as the others, but just bigger and further out from the nucleus at a greater distance from the nucleus. But what about the other 14? This covers the first 18 out of 32. The other 14 electrons are found in what we'll just say is a very complex shaped region. Um, that's because there's there's quite a bit of variation in the sh in the shapes of those last 14 and their orbital shapes, their paths. We start to use, and you heard me say the word orbital there, electrons, we don't necessarily think about them moving in a perfect orbit like a planet around the sun, where it's just a sort of a, a straight line, or I shouldn't say straight line, but sort of a vector path where they're moving in this, this sort of or orbital shape, this ellipse. Electrons move in a much more complex way than that, but to sort of have some chance to understand and explain them, we, we describe it as having the shape of an orbital, or the, the, the path of the electron is moving around in an orbital, uh, which is that region where that electron tends to be found. And it's a three-dimensional shape instead of more of a flat, plane, planar shape like planets are around the sun. So we have four different descriptions, a sphere, a figure eight, a clover leaf, and then just to keep it simple, a complex shaped region that's hard to even put words to. That describes the four main ways that electrons are found in atoms that we know of so far in the periodic table. So let's take those, those 2, 6, 10, and 14. We're actually going to take those numbers and try to go back to our periodic table just a little bit with those because these are some familiar numbers. And it's sort of almost like a, like a treasure hunt or sort of like some sort of code breaker idea. But 2, 6, 10, and 14 are sort of Sherlock Holmes the way in my brain here as I've seen those numbers somewhere before, and maybe you don't realize that you have, and maybe you've learned all this before, and this is just review, and that's great. You should go back and thank whatever teacher gave you an introduction to this. But 2, 6, 10, and 14 are sort of hidden numbers here in our periodic table. 2 corresponds to that first region on the left of your periodic table, where the, that section is two, we'd say, boxes or spaces wide, but that really corresponds with those two electrons moving in a spherical way in a way that we'll describe more as we go. Six corresponds to this section over on the right-hand side of the periodic table. That's six elements wide, six boxes across, but represents six electrons that are moving in those figure eight shaped ways. So that's what that part of our periodic table and the number six sort of match up with. 10 represents the middle section of our periodic table that's between the two and the six. We have this section that's 10 elements wide, 10 boxes across, and it represents the 10 electrons that we sort of would, would describe as moving in a cloverleaf shaped three-dimensional way around the nucleus in those, in those energy levels, starting with the third energy level where we saw those cloverleaf shaped ones and continuing on to all the higher energy levels. So level three, level four, level five, level six, those can all have those cloverleafs in groups of 10 at the most. And then 14 represents a little sort of section of the periodic table that's disconnected from the rest. And that 14 element section of the periodic table actually sticks in amongst the rest of the periodic table. It's actually, it belongs in truth, that section sort of fits right in here. If we were to sort of take a saw or a scissor and cut down this line between the two and the 10, and take imagine sort of splitting along this line right here. If we slip this, snip this, snip this in half, and then inserted the elements here in this section that's 14 wide, we would have to sort of push the 10 and the six sections over to the right, and the section with two here over to the left, and we would insert these 14 kind of right in here in this little space. The reason it's not done that way on our periodic table that we see hanging in classrooms and the one that you got with your materials this year, the reason it's not done that way is partly at least because the periodic table would be very difficult to print on a typical size sheet of paper. It would be very wide and very short, and it'd be kind of oblong and awkward. And so that's really the biggest reason why those 14 are removed from their normal sort of expected positions for ease of displaying the periodic table. That seems like a dumb way to, to dumb reason to do it, but that's really the best reason behind why those 14 uh, section, that section that's 14 boxes wide rather, is isolated down there on the bottom. So these sections of the periodic table, there's four different, we call them blocks of the periodic table. They have names. We refer to this first column over here as the S block. In lowercase, the S block. This section on the right we call the P block. This section in between them we call the D block. And then down below we have the F block. Now, why those are called S, P, D, and F 
has to do a lot with how we first understand or understood the distribution of electrons within the atom. When people looked at um, did, uh, gra graphical or sort of uh, visual displays that showed how the electrons were seemed, seemed to be different in different groups. They behaved differently if they were found in this sort of what we described eventually as an S or a P or a D or an F region within the atom. And those, those four letters, S, P, D, and F, represent four uh, different descriptors sort of of, of what the, uh, the, the peaks or the, the visual look like on the picture. And uh, so, so they don't have to do with necessarily anything specific. S here doesn't stand for spherical. They don't necessarily describe the geometry that we've been talking about. I won't try to have you get to know or be familiar with S, P, D, and F, what they stand for. You're not responsible for that. You're certainly welcome to look it up if you're curious about those abbreviations. But I won't make you have to uh, be responsible for those, uh, understanding what S, P, D, and F stand for. And I, as students year after year, they'll say, why did they use S, P, D, F? Why can't we just call it like A, B, C, D? That would be so much easier. And I don't disagree with you, um, but chemistry is what chemistry is, and, and the rules are what they are. So we have to call them what, what the official folks that came before us have called them, which sometimes is less convenient than we'd like. So if I label those sections as S, P, D, and F with those letters that I've got there, the S, P, D, and F regions then can be kind of used to describe and assign these electrons. The S, P, D, and F regions can be used to label then and give sort of a little bit of a code to these electrons within the energy level. So energy level one with its two electrons, if we take those two electrons and we think about where they sort of represent within the atom, the periodic table, we would, we would assign those two electrons sort of over there. And so in our periodic table, we would call that section of the periodic table the 1s section. And the 1s section then represents these two spaces right here. Now, I don't want you to think about 1s representing any particular elements. On your periodic table, these two spaces are represent would represent hydrogen and helium. Okay. Notice what we've done here, and I should maybe should have mentioned this sooner. Helium is usually found over here in the top right corner of our periodic table, right? Right above neon in this spot here. What we do for our purposes of understanding electrons and how they're organized within the atom and how we can label them to understand them and keep track of them better, we actually take helium and we move it over here. So it's like we, we chopped it off this corner and we glued it on over here to make this kind of a nice rectangle. And the region is, the reason that we do that is because helium's got two electrons and those two electrons, we would say, are moving around in a spherical shaped way at a distance that we would define as level one from the nucleus. So hydrogen and helium both have electrons in this, in this little section of the table then that represent the spherical shaped path of an S electron and at a distance that represents level one. So don't think about these two boxes necessarily as hydrogen and helium all the time. That's kind of what they represent. But specifically that these two boxes represent two electrons. And those two electrons are moving around in a spherical shaped way very close to the nucleus. So we call that level one. Okay. What about level two? We had this two and the six that we mentioned earlier on. Well, different shapes, sphere and figure eight mean that they come from different blocks of the periodic table. So your shape as, as your electron, the shape of your region that you live in or move about in as an electron tells us sort of where we would assign you on the periodic table. So those two and six electrons from level two represent, again, because they're spheres, they represent part of the S block. And then the six electrons represent electrons moving around in a figure eight shaped way. And so we would define now this little section, this first strip of that's in red here, as representing up to six electrons that are moving in a figure eight shaped sort of orbital path or, or, or a pathway around the nucleus. And those six are found slightly further out from the nucleus than level one, so we say that they're found in level two. We define that distance from the nucleus as level two. And the elements in these six spaces are the first elements of the periodic table's elements to have electrons that are found in those ways to have electrons that are found moving around in figure eight shaped pathways at a distance that we, we would define as distance level two from the nucleus. So as you look at the periodic table, we know that this is boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Those elements are the first six elements of our periodic table as we, as we move down that have electrons that are found in figure eight shaped paths. But it's really important to know that every single element that comes after them also has those electrons because we're just building on and building on and building on nucleus for everybody and then electrons in level one and then electrons in level two. So as we sort of walk our way through this periodic table, like some sort of chemistry board game, I don't know, we're actually adding more and more electrons 
to more and more complex and distant from the nucleus uh, regions within the atom. And so just because boron, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon are in this section 2p, we would define this as reg a part 2p of the periodic table. It also, it doesn't mean that no one else has those. It means that they're the first to have those. And everybody else down here in the lower part of the periodic table also has those electrons. They have those and even more. Okay. Level three, we've got those two that are in a sphere, six that are figure eight, ten that are cloverleaf from before. And again, different shapes means different blocks. So sphere, figure eight, and cloverleaf come from three different parts of our periodic table. Spheres will still and always will come from the S region of our periodic table. So those two electrons, we would say, get classified as 3S electrons here. The next six electrons, moving around in a figure eight shape path, always go to P then, as far as their sub-level. Sub and so those six electrons are moving around here and are assigned in the 3P section of our periodic table. And then the other 10 electrons, fall into this region here. So this is what we would define as our 3D region of the periodic table. Those 10 electrons then are moving around a cloverleaf shaped path. And the first elements that we find that have cloverleaf shaped electron pathways in their electron cloud are the elements here in 3D. So starting out with scandium and then moving all the way through across here to zinc, those, those 10 elements in this first row are the first 10 elements of our periodic table that we would say have some electrons moving around in a clover sheep, clover leaf shaped way, right? And then finally, level four, we have two, six, 10, and 14. You may be getting, a, getting the hang of this now. The, the first two represent sphere shaped electron paths, so they're gonna be over there in the S. The next six represent a, a figure eight shaped electron path, they're gonna be over there in the P section. The next 10 are a clover leaf shaped pathway, they're gonna be there in the D section. And the last 14 represent something that's moving around in a very elaborate, complex way that we just call the F section, okay? So we've assigned then energy levels one, two, three, and four. And we can extend the idea if the patterns continue. We can count to seven, anybody can count to seven. Then you can just sort of add on and continue until we run out of periodic table. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we run out of periodic table here in the S section, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we run out of space here in the P section, right? Uh, three, four, five, six, we run out of space. And then F is just two rows, so that's just four and five. So on any periodic table that you get, a blank one, even one that's been filled in completely with information, like the one that you got with your materials for this for our class, any periodic table, even my little wallet-sized, pocket-sized periodic table that I carry on my wallet, yes, it's true. I'm, a, I'm that big of a nerd. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. I've used it many times in a pinch. Um, well, I mean, not like to solve any mysteries or solve crimes or anything, but still pretty, uh, still pretty cool. I think it's cool. I'll wait for you to stop your laughing at me. I can feel it from here. My heart withers. Anyways, S, P, D, and F. Any periodic table I can look at and, and see these four regions, S, P, D, and F. Any periodic table that I look at, I can count the rows. I can count to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then notice the numbering isn't all that complex. People get kind of baffled by this, but notice that we start the S with number one and we count down until we run out of space, one through seven. We start the P with two and we work until we run out of rows, two down through seven. We start the D section here with three and we run out of rows at six. And then we start F with four and we run out of rows at five. So we start with one and then two and then three and then four. So starting them with consecutive integers is sort of important to, to know that if you're going to go through and throw these numbers and letters down on a periodic table, you don't start with one everywhere. You start with one and then two and then three and then four until you run out. Okay. Because energy level one doesn't have P, D, and F shaped electron paths. And energy level two doesn't have D and F shaped electron paths. And level three doesn't have F-shaped electron paths, so we don't start those until those later later energy levels come about. Okay, so there's the two levels, two electrons from level one. They would be found there. The eight electrons from level two would sort of be, be assigned in those positions. The eighteen electrons from level three would be assigned in those boxes. The thirty-two electrons from level four would be assigned in those boxes. So two here, six here, ten here, and then the last fourteen are way down in here and so forth and so on okay, from there. So this sort of organizational structure is an important one to be able to come up with. There's a page, you should have a page of these uh, periodic tables that are sort of laid out this way. 
um, in your uh, materials that you can work from and use kind of as a, as a fill-in as you, as you work through examples to understand how the electrons of different elements then would be organized and the way that we sort of write out a notation for that. So if we're talking about a, you know, an element with lots and lots of electrons, so an, like an atom of lead right, with 82 electrons, that's a lot of electrons to keep track of. And you sort of have to keep an inventory of them, keep a sort of a, an auditor, keep a census of them. We have a way of organizing that that's really shorthand and really and really uh, short and, and uh, handy, much more compact. But it uses these letters and numbers sort of as an organizational code. And the sooner you practice with those, the sooner you'll master that code and be able to work through some examples. Uh, and, and frankly, you'll be able to do any one of the 118 elements that are on our current periodic table today. You won't have to do all of them. Uh, I typically won't ask you to go beyond right around barium, uh, which gets us not even halfway through the periodic table in terms of the total. Uh, but that's if you can go that far, that's probably far enough. So we, we won't go through and have you do all 118, but we'll have you do a variety of practice on different elements from the different parts so that you get the hang of how to handle just about anything that comes your way. So that's an introduction to the elements of the periodic table, or rather not the elements, but the electrons of the elements of the periodic table, and how we sort of describe them in terms of their distance from the nucleus, that's that energy level, one through seven, and in terms of the sort of shape of their, we would say, region that they occupy. We don't like to say their motion because their motion is a little too simplistic, but if you say that, that's cool. We could say that electrons are moving or existing in a sphere-shaped path if they're an S, in a figure eight-shaped path if they're a P, in a cloverleaf shaped path if they're a d electron and in a very complex way that we can't really easily describe or define if they're an f electron and we don't have a lot of those elements that deal with f electrons when we come right down to our everyday practice with this so those abstract complex ones in the f block will typically stay out of our way anyways so that's good news perhaps so that's an introduction i hope that made some sense Hope you took some notes down. If you need to go back and listen to anything else, this video will be available to you forever. And uh, you can go back whenever you need to to kind of revisit things if it helps. And uh, until I get you some practice to work on and work through some examples, I'll see you then. And thanks for listening along.